So we are, I, I, a couple of things before we start. We're, we're starting May, which is sort of a traditional month for us to start talking about missions. Every year we take an offering, a missions offering, that is basically dedicated to a number of different missional um, efforts around the world. So today we're actually privileged to have someone coming from one of the fields that we serve in Russia. So we have, we'll hear some, from someone today here. Um, and then the other thing is that I'm offering a membership class if you're considering becoming a member of Tribe. Uh, I usually just every once in a while I open it up before church. Like we, we, we know that you're really devoted if you come an hour early, right? So, so you can come and we can have a face-to-face -face and I can hear your story. So if you want to do that, go on the website austinchristian.org and then register there so that we know that you're coming. So those are the things. I want to get that out of the way. But back to what we're doing today. Today, we're continuing a series called Come and, Come and See Stories of Transformation. And the whole premise of the series is that it, there's a disconnect between true faith and religion. And the disconnect has to do with experiencing something, right? So that's why people either that are, don't know anything about Christianity or God or Jesus, look at look at. Christians and go, I don't even get it, right? Now that was me. Or if you've been in the faith for a while and things slowly start disconnecting, right? So you stop experiencing God as God, the power of God, and it becomes a strange sort of double life type of thing, right? The tension starts building. And both of those things get changed if somebody who is skeptical or who is sort of has experiencing dryness, sort of like this desert in the faith, can experience the power of God. And that's the whole point. So in, in scripture, there's a couple of instances where literally the phrase come and see comes, uh, comes to play. And, and that's always has to do with a reintroduction of someone to the power of God, how real he is, how powerful he is. And that changes everything. So what we're doing is doing this arch ag across the, uh, the, the book of Acts. And we're, we're sharing all these stories of transformation. There's so many of them, but we're, we picked just five of them. And what we did is we decided to come to come, like put like archetypes together. Like, okay, one story, one archetype, which type of person are you? Right. And today we're going to talk about one of the most exciting people in the book of Acts is the apostle Paul and his archetype. You know, I was sort of playing around with what to call it is the enemy. Right. And you know, not like, Thanos enemy type, you know, but really the enemy in, in, in the sense of he opposes Christianity, he opposes the church, that sort of thing, right? And this is an interesting type because you, you know, uh, there's probably no enemy of the church here because an enemy doesn't come to Sunday service. So why are we speaking about that? Well, you'll, you'll find out, right? It's highly unlikely that if you're an enemy that you will come. So Paul, the Apostle Paul is really astonishing as a story because he was literally an enemy of the church, a high uh, sort of influence guy who persecuted the church, threw people in jail, and he is at the same time, after his conversion, became one of the greatest apostles. He single-handedly sort of opened up the Gentile world that, uh, before he really started really working um, powerfully. Most of the church were mostly Jewish, right? So he started going on these missionary journeys, and uh, he single-handedly wrote a big part of the New Testament, right? So that's just crazy, right? How do you go from enemy to writing the New Testament? That's the story, and that's how powerful it is. So the one thing, and it's very counterintuitive, counterintuitive as, a, as a concept, if you factor out God. And that's why I wanted to talk about that. And the first thing I want you to remember is that an enemy of God is the best candidate for transformation, which is a counterintuitive statement to make. It's the best candidate, he, is the, he or she is the best candidate of transformation, and I'll tell you exactly why that is true, even though it doesn't feel right, right? Here's, here's a few, here are a few reasons. An enemy of God has enough convictions to hate. You have to have convictions to hate, right? You have to care enough, uh, enough confidence to act. So somebody needs to be so motivated that he, he or she does stuff all the time to oppose, the, to oppose God or the church. Enough talent to convince. Somebody needs to be eloquent enough 
to share their story and convince a bunch of people that, that Christianity doesn't, doesn't mean anything, right? Uh, enough regret to appreciate amazing grace. Somebody like that usually has enough stuff in their heart where they go, when they get saved and, and, and forgiven, it just opens up this flood of energy and power and passion, right? Enough heart to embrace God's providence, which is really awesome, right? And we'll talk about it just in a second, how amazing that dichotomy is, right? Like it's, it's, it's somebody is an enemy of God and yet receiving forgiveness from God and how that even harmonizes together. And then lastly, enough opposition to God to be a perfect target for God because God's going to go, you, you are opposing me. Let me show you my power, right? Does that make sense? So, and Paul is one of those people, and I love, there's, there's a couple of scriptures that I love where he basically at the sa- in the same breath, in the same sentence, talks about just how bad he is, and yet at the same time, how that fits into God's providence, into God's plan, all at the same time, in great harmony. In Galatians 1, 13, he says, for you have heard my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. See, I'm the enemy, and yet this was all part of God's plan because he is above all those things. In 1 Corinthians 15, 9, he says, For I am the least of the apostles. And do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am who I am. So he's not just sort of going, okay, I'm the least of the apostles, therefore I'm paralyzed, PTSD, and do nothing. He just says, no, no, I'm the least of the, I, don't, I don't even deserve to be called an apostle. And yet by the grace of God, he embraces this grace. I am who I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. So he says, no, 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 no. I wasn't just forgiven. This fueled me to do amazing things. And he says, no, I work harder than all of them. He basically says, I work harder than all the apostles because I don't even deserve to be one. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with, with me. Does that make sense? Just incredible. So much packed in these scriptures, right? And as I said, the, you know, the, the enemy doesn't the likelihood of, of somebody sitting here going, yeah, I'm an enemy of God, that's why I'm here. It's close to zero. These are people that don't come to church, right? If you're one of them, former enemy, you'll, you'll probably nod to that, right? And these are people that, that most Christians have a hard time, you know, we sort of see somebody like that at the workplace or a friend or a family member, and we just go, yeah, you know what, I'm not going to engage this. And, but, and yet, I, I want, this is an important message today, and to hear those stories is important for us, because we need to understand that these are some of the best people for God to reach. They're the best candidates. I have a friend, uh, you know, I, I talk to him, uh, about him a, a lot, uh, but you see examples of that all over the place if you pay attention. I have a friend in Russia, his name is Sergei, he's part of the mafia, and he like really harassed his buddy who was a Christian, and then he harassed me, and he threatened, and now he leads a church, right? So, so there's another guy that I know in Africa, his name is Araujo Francisco, and he, he, he became a church leader, but he started off as a child soldier in Angola for years and years and years, fighting in the bush, doing all kinds of things that he regrets, right? Um, there's another friend of mine in Africa, uh, his name is Shadanki Johnson, and he, um, he works in Sierra Leone, uh, where there's a predominantly Muslim population, and he was captured by this warlord who knew about his activity, right, uh, as, 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 a, as a preacher. And he had a gun to his head by this warlord, and he basically shared his faith and said, you know, you're going to kill me anyway, might as well tell you something. Can, can you give me a minute? And he, he said, sure. You know? And he basically said, look, if I die, I know where I'm going. But when you die, you don't know where you're going. And I can tell you where. This, this warlord is now a church planter. <laughs> right? Uh, so the, the stories go on and on and on. I have actually somebody in the audience today who, who has a similar story of being opposing the faith and yet 
changing. So Trevor, can you come down? Can you welcome Trevor here? We're going to have a little talk here. So we need a mic. I will grab a random mic. There you go, man. Hello. Okay, good. So, so Trevor, tell me about your Thanos oh. life. <laughs> um, hopefully, it wasn't it wasn't that bad. But it's been so convicting to like reflect on all this. Um, so, I grew up pretty non-religious and um, not going to church and that kind of thing, except for like a random, mm -hmm. very odd experience at times. Uh, and so, when I was in college. You know, we'd, you know, you'd sit around and talk about different things, and so we would philosophize about God and about religion and about all that. And so, sitting in the, um, you know, in the dorm rooms, you know, I would, I didn't believe in God, and so I would speak out against it. And um, people would kind of jump on the bandwagon, like behind the things that I was saying, and it just sort of like fueled this actually really terrible atmosphere. And um, and so, so yeah, so we would do that and sort of like go after it. And I would, and I didn't, you know, I thought people that believed in God were weak and how could they do this and, you know, all those different things. So, so where, where'd you go to school? UT. UT. And you were, you were studying what? Uh, so at the time I was studying chemical engineering. Ah, oh, and that changed. That, well, I, well, so I went through, I got my degree in chemical engineering and then I went to law school. Okay. And I was converted in my summer before I went to law school. Okay. So you were in UT and you were talking trash about Christians, basically. Yes, yes, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, and so, um, so and, and it didn't like, you know, when I studied the Bible, I remember talking about this and sort of like confessing, and, but it, it, it was one of those things that didn't like hit me exactly how strongly I was saying things until, and God really got me. Um, a couple years later, so I, we were starting school and I was on campus and I was sharing my faith and um, I shared with this guy, we were in pairs, and I shared with this guy. So hold on, hold on. So before that, you were sharing your faith about how Christians are weak. Yes, yes, yep, yep. And just to make the point, you are now sharing your faith yep. in the opposite direction. Right, yes. Okay, yeah. cool, yeah. interesting. Yeah, now, yeah, yeah, now, now sharing my faith in the opposite direction. Okay, like trying, to, trying to help people become yeah. Christians. Okay. So, um, so this guy, I reached out to him, oh, hey, I'd like to invite you out to church, and he goes, uh, Trevor, are you Trevor Lind? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm Trevor Lind. He goes, I'm, I'm Jen. I, 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 I was your RA. I lived in the um, dorms with you. And I was like, oh, yeah, oh, it's so good to see you. What are you doing here? He goes, oh, I'm starting law school. And I was like, oh, really? You know, I'm, I'm in law school. And he goes, he looks at me and he goes, I can't believe that you're a Christian. And I go, well, what do you mean? And he goes, do you remember all those times we'd be in the dorm and you'd be you know, talking about God and all that stuff? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. He says, you were so terrible and like the way that you would do things and the things that you would say he goes i never ever thought that you'd become a christian in fact i prayed this impossible prayer that you would become a christian oh wow and i was just sort of like whoa that's crazy and so um so i just saw how god had worked and you know when i had become a christian i i was i, I had just started believing in god like a few months before that and i wasn't really looking um, and so, but it's really interesting because this guy never, he, came, he didn't come to church, but he did come to um, like different events and he and I would end up debating about Christianity. <laughs> and so I end up defending my faith sort of against this person, my Christian faith, instead of like opposing him to mm -hmm. try and get him not to believe. That's, that's, that's remarkable. So, so tell me, tell me something. How did you... Obviously, you, you were, we, we went from opposing the faith to being in the faith and mm -hmm. to finding someone who knew you from the, back then. When, when did you come, and what was, the, what was the spark? What was the catalyst for that? Well, you know, I had been around a lot of people who were, you know, were, were, were religious, so I had been come a part of this, this group, the, uh, this multi-level marketing group, and so there was a lot of, like, talk about God and religion and all these different things, and so um, I started thinking, well... Maybe there is a God, and so I was. So I'd gone into my biochemistry class one day, and um, the the professor was talking about, oh, evolution, and this evolves to this, and this evolves to that, and this evolves to this and to that. And I was like, I don't know if I totally believe that. And I feel like you know we can love and we can have like all of these really amazing joy, joy, and like all of these um, these great um, emotions. 
And so it sort of helped me to believe in God. And then if several months after that, someone was on, I was just walking on campus and um, someone reached out to me and said, hey, you know, would you like to come to church? And I was sort of like, sure, you know, okay, I'm starting to believe in God. I don't know anything. I kind of had this vague idea that maybe I should do something, but I didn't know. And so they invited me out and, you know, my first Bible study was, this is the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Like I knew nothing. And um, so you and, had strong opinions, although you knew nothing before that. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's, that's, it, which is it's really interesting. makes no sense. Yeah. yeah, I have all these strong opinions. Yeah, I had no no knowledge at all. <laughs> and so, um, so yeah. So then started to study the Bible, and then when we got to the cross, it sort of like was a process for me to like it was it wasn't easy to connect emotionally with hmm. Jesus and with the cross. But, but some people had some hard conversations with me about it, and it sort of helped me to pray and to be able to get to the point where I could um, really do that. So, so just to, to wrap this up, what would you say to people? Because obviously you wouldn't be in this service no. naturally. No. Like you just don't pop into a Sunday service and go, let me debate somebody. Like that doesn't happen. Yeah. It's very... So, but some, so there was a catalyst in your life, right? Somebody invited you. What would you say to all of us who walk around and we, you know, most of us know at least one or two people like that, that are sort of abrasive, a little bit, you know, strong-willed and stuff like that. And what would you say to all of us here who maybe know an enemy, quote unquote, out there? Well, don't give up on us, please. Um, you know, someone had the faith to pray for me mm -hmm. and God worked. Um, and it's really convicting and humbling um, to be able to think about that. I mean, God is pretty intense about people who hurt other people's faith and what he thinks about them. And so, but he still wants them to become Christians and still loves us. And so I think it's just a matter of, so like what really helped me like to even start to believe in God was just being around people who were joyful and who it was sort of like, wow, there's something different about them. And it kind of made me think a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, and then over time, it wasn't immediate, but over years, God worked and be able and open my heart. So don't give up. It might not be immediate, but things are going on in the background, just like they were in my life that um, end up opening um, your heart up. And the rest of your life has, was transformed, right? Oh yeah, ab absolutely. Like, can, you, can you think back now and go, what if that, that didn't happen? I, what, yeah, what? sometimes I do. It's horrible, actually, <laughs> to, to, to think about, like, who I would be and just a, a very just sort of bitter person um, without a lot of joy or hope or any of those things. So yeah. it's very frightening, yeah, to think about that. Thanks for sharing your story. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So this was... That, what an amazing story, and I just love that we have Trevor here to, to give you sort of the behind the curtains, this is what's going on. <laughs> and, and it really helps, you know, what I, what I, what I learned from even that, those conversations with Trevor and some of the things that I've experienced and seen and heard is that how do we see more Pauls in the church, right? Well, to see more Pauls in the church, we need to change. And we need to get, get rid of some illusions, right? Some preconceived ideas that we may have that prevent us from connecting with people like that. And I want to just share four of those illusions with you. So uh, the first one is that there's such a thing as the wrong candidate to be a Christian. You know, that's an illusion. That's not true. And even as a Christian, you might not even say it with your mouth, but you might think it. I know I've thought it many, many times. Many, many times. I judge people. I judge people and I look at somebody and I speak to someone and I go, yeah, that's, that person's not open. Simple as that, right? And, and it's, if I catch myself, I realize that that's just a, such a preconceived idea and it's just not true. There's no such a thing as a wrong candidate for being a Christian. It doesn't exist, right? Um, I, have, I, was, I was doing a podcast recently, which is going to actually, you, want, you might want to look that up later. I think it's going to come out in about a week or two with a um, rocket scientist who was, his name was Jack Frederick. He's a friend of mine. And he, he designed all these rockets and I mean, did the, all this amazing stuff. Like we, he talks and my head hurts, right? It's one of those people. And he basically told me a story that some time ago, uh, this is in the Clinton years, he had the opportunity to connect with Clinton. He wrote him a letter and uh, I read it to, a letter to the president. He basically said, look, here's what I want you to do. I know you're going to be in, 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 in town, 
and I would love for you to come to church with me, and then I'll, I'll buy you lunch, and then I'll study the Bible with you. You know, will you, will you please do that? And he had an oppor- a window of, of opportunity, and, uh, and Clinton apparently wrote back and declined, you know, and, but wrote back. And he says, you know what struck me is that a year later, Bill Clinton was in the Monica Lewinsky scandal. And he says, I thought to myself, if he had said yes, how much pain he would have saved himself, his family, his wife, his country, right? These are the opportunities. That's what I'm talking about. So what Trevor said is really, really important and valuable. Don't give up on us. Uh, In Acts 9, uh, um, um, it describes the supernatural part, and this is the second illusion, is that somehow we have the power to transform an enemy. That's an illusion, and that's a paralyzing thought. Because if you think, I, if I approach somebody like that, intense like that, opinionated like that, abrasive like that, that I should probably have the power to transform that person. That's a lie, because you don't. You don't have that power. And if you realize and internalize the fact that you don't have that power, that's a liberating thing. Like, you know, with my, 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 my friend Jack knew that he doesn't have the power to transform Bill Clinton. But he does have the power to inform Bill Clinton if he chooses to listen. And that's all we're, we've been asked to do. Because the power to transform anybody is God's. And in Paul's story, that role and that moment is really epic, right? Really, really epic. Here's what it says. Um, as he neared Damascus on his journey, he was going from one place to another. Suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persuade me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom we are persecuting. He replied, now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. You know, so Paul was that one guy, one enemy, right? The caliber of guy who probably Jesus was watching for a while. And he's like, you know what, that's it, I'm coming down, you know? <laughs> Jesus had to intervene. Like, you have to be a really particularly abrasive person for Jesus to intervene personally. And the truth is, he does with all of us. And although it might not be flashes of light, it not might be the, a voice from heaven, and if you read the whole, the whole text, the, 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 the people that were traveling with Paul heard the voice as well. They didn't see anything but heard the voice and they were perplexed. Like imagine walking around with somebody, you know, you have a particular knucklehead friend, and a voice comes and starts rebuking your friend. Like that's gotta be like really freaky, right? You go, okay, I'm, you know what, I don't know him, you know? Uh, but that's what happened with Paul. But the truth is, even though it was visible and epic, that happens with every single person who's transformed. God is the one who transforms. God is the one who speaks. God is the one who changes the heart. And there's no such thing as a bad candidate to be a Christian. Right? That's just flawed thinking. And there's no such thing as you transforming somebody. You don't have that power. Just relax. And inform the person. It's not your job to transform, right? Uh, so what happens is, God transformed Paul or I wouldn't say transformed, he, he visited Paul and made him pay, pay attention. But he still used somebody else, a human being. Not even a super, like, super powerful human being necessarily, to inform Paul. Here's, what, here's how it happened. Um, he, he comes, Jesus speaks to this guy Ananias, right? And we don't hear from Ananias, and this is an interesting thing. If you think, I'm just not that person, I'm not this assertive you know, A-type person, I'm an introvert, whatever. Whatever story that you say to yourself to not act, right? There's a guy that, his name is Ananias, he's the one who baptized Paul, and we don't hear from him before or after that story. We just don't. He was chosen by God to inform Paul that is it. And I love that. As an introvert, I'm like, you know what? I don't want that kind of pressure. Just tell me what to do. I'll speak to somebody, and then I'll let you do your thing, God. But I'll be obedient, 
right? And here's what happens. So, he, Lord, uh, Lord, Ananias answered. I've heard many reports. So he says, Ananias, you need to go find Paul. Ananias, first of all, says, I don't want to go. And which is totally fine to be honest with God like that. I love that, right? And the Bible tells us how it, how it is. He says, I don't want to go. I have heard from many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. So he's basically, say, he's basically saying, God maybe might be underinformed about this one. <laughs> so he's filling in the blanks. Like, let me give you some context, God. I know about this guy, right? And, and, then he, and then he goes, but the Lord said to Ananias, go, like exclamation points. I wonder what that what was, felt like, right? Go. Losing your patience, I don't know. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias, he goes, okay. You know, the exclamation point went up, I'm going. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who had appeared to you in the road, on the road as you were coming here, has sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. Once again, baptism, deeply significant, but all you need is, is to accept Jesus as Lord and repent. Not a long process, right? See, all of those people that I talked to you about, Trevor, somebody spoke to him. Somebody prayed for him. Sergey, my friend, my wrestler mafia friend who's now a church leader, you know, he tells the story. He was here actually and told the story. And I still have loss of memory about that particular story he tells because he said, he claims that I told him at one point in a heated argument that he's not man enough if he doesn't follow Jesus. <laughs> And I, apparently he, he got him paying attention. I don't remember saying that. I think it was the Holy Spirit taking over, temporary insanity, that sort of thing. You know? Um, Araujo, the, my friend from Angola who was a child soldier, somebody, somebody spoke to him. Somebody informed him. God transformed him. But somebody informed him. Somebody reached out. Somebody prayed, right? Um, that warlord, you know, was, had my, my friend Shadanke Johnson tied up with a gun to his, to his head. And Shadanki chose to speak truth. That's what he chose to do. And he was, the definition of powerless was Shadanki Johnson on his knees, tied up with a gun to his head. So he didn't transform that guy. It was God. But Shadanki spoke, spoke to him and, and chose to inform him, right? Here's the fourth illusion, the last one that I think we... We, we play, play around with and sort of allow us, uh, it, it sort of infects the way we think, right? And here's, here's the other one, that transformation is a moment in time and not a journey. The transformation, it's a moment, it's a flash, and where, who are we to be part of something like that? Like, this is stuff that you read in the Bible, this is stuff that you see in movies, this is Thanos doing this, you know, all of that stuff, right? Like, who are we? And the truth is, Transformation is a journey, it's not a moment in time. So any, any given story that we've mentioned today, it was all a journey. Like Paul, there was a flash of light and there was something epic going on, but there was a pre-story to this. He watched Stephen, the first martyr, being stoned. And he saw that and he saw the way he died. And I bet as a young man holding the cloaks of the people who were stoning Stephen, he thought to himself, who dies like that? Trevor had a pre-story and transformation was long. Uh, my, my, my friend Sergey had a, a friend, a colleague of his, who would share his faith with him over and over and over again, way before the, the epic shift happened, right? With Paul, even after he became he became a, a Christian, and in, in Acts 9, 20, it says, at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. So this at once thing tells us, these are things that don't happen in my life. I don't, uh, things in, I don't have at once experiences. But the truth is, even after he started preaching in the synagogues, there was a journey 
of fine-tuning his character, right? If, you, if you're a student of, uh, of Paul, it's really funny because he was so abrasive, everybody wanted to kill him. You know, the non-Christians wanted to kill him, the Christians wanted to kill him, like the Jews wanted to kill him. He got in so much trouble for so long that once he really truly engages as the Paul we know, the writer of the Bible, the great missionary, the great apostle, years passed before that. There are whole years, there's like three or four years where we don't know where he was. We just don't know. And my theory is that he's being, see, the transformation was this process going on during that time. You know, it's just a slow thing, right? So here's my question. We're going to take communion and the Lord's Supper and the bread and the wine. My question to you is this. Which illusions about God's plan are you entertaining, right? Or hold, holding on to? And especially in relation to the people that you know around you who are the particularly abrasive ones, right? Um, do you rationalize your in inaction with, oh, this is just a bad candidate, right? Or, oh, you know, it's, it's I can't change this guy. There's no way, you know? <laughs> or is that, you know, I'm not, things like that don't happen in my life. They happen in books and movies and maybe that guy over there who's particularly impressive to me, you know? Um, all of those things that we carry around, I think we need to get rid of them. And I just pray that maybe during this time of contemplation when we take the bread, take the juice, we might get rid of some of those illusions. I want to leave you with this one scripture that the enemy, the former enemy of God and now Apostle Paul writes about what we're experiencing here today together when we take the bread and we take the Lord's cup. It says, for if while we were God's enemies, and he's now talking about all of us, we were reconciled to him through his death, how much more, having, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Let's pray.